Good morning. Good to see you on this uh, last holiday weekend of the year, all right, until you get to Thanksgiving and Christmas. But uh, anyway, welcome. It's good to have you out today. Um, I love that song. Uh, it's a power, powerful song for me. But sometimes I suspect that maybe we run right over words and we don't, we don't appreciate the full impact of what we've just sung. Um, all the promises that were involved and all the benefits involved in that song are connected to the last line. I am a child of God. And we're not a child of God because we're born in America. I'm not a child of God because I am a grandson and a son of preachers. Um, None of that makes any difference. I am a child of God because at some point in my life, I made a discovery that required humility. I made a discovery that said, I can't live life on earth by myself, and I have no control over my eternal destiny. And so I have to come to a point with humility that says, God, because I haven't accepted you, I've rejected you, and that makes me a sinner. We often talk about being a sinner and we, we, we stumble over that word, it, it, we mumble it oftentimes, because we always want to connect it to activity. We want to connect it to the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's adultery, it's murder, it's stealing. And so we don't like to say that word sinner because we think we're saying, I'm an adulterer, I'm a murderer, I'm a thief. All of those are results of sin, but But what we really have to come to grips with is this fact is I'm a sinner because God doesn't live in me. I'm a sinner because I want to be the God of my own life. And so the humbling part of of confession, of saying I'm a sinner, is not admitting that I'm a thief, an adulterer, a liar, or a murderer, but it's humbling ourselves to say, I choose not to be God of my life anymore. That's, that's the humility, as I don't want to be the one who controls my life anymore. I want to trust somebody. And then come these benefits in the midst of a troubled world. There is absolutely no charge for that sermon, all right? That one was not planned nor prepared for this morning. Um, That that was one of those brief moment ones. Uh, But thanks for being here. It's good to have you with us today on uh, on Labor Day weekend. Did it not feel good this morning? Oh, 54 degrees in my house this morning. It was so good. It was so good. Um, And I still didn't wear a tie, Uh, but that's okay. We'll we'll get to it in in, in a few weeks. Uh, If you are a guest today on this holiday weekend, thank you. You honor us by choosing to be with us on a holiday. And uh, there are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. Uh, I would love for you to fill it out, put it in the offering bag when it comes by. Make a promise not to beat on your door or annoy you on the phone, but through the mail we'll send you information that tells you what goes on around here, what we believe, the kind of ministries that uh, you might want to know about and participate in. So we'd love to get that in your hand. And other than that, we will not, uh, we, we will not annoy you. Um, Thanks for being here. There's a new card in the pew, and I want to tell you about it, all right? It's not very big, all right? It's short, okay? Kind of like me. Um, So it looks just like this, all right? And it says at the top, Pops Marketplace, all right? Uh, Dad's starting a new business. (laughs) Just kidding, all right? Uh, This is a small group that Pops happens to be a part of, all right? And small groups are encouraged to get engaged in... um, uh, in service. And so this particular uh, small group wants to be involved in service to the church, and they are going to prepare what's called Pop's Marketplace. And uh, there's no charge for this. You just need to give them information. And the cards are in the pew. So week to week, if you have something that you would like to list, all right, at Pop's Marketplace, and it will be distributed, made available to folks in one of two ways. It will get printed, and you will find it out on uh, the welcome cart. We may distribute it sometimes during service, uh, but also it will be online. We'll have it at our website. And this is if there are, are, are needs you have or things you have that somebody else might need, uh, and you want a place to, to, to list it so that it can be an advantage to both of you. Uh, so if you've got something to sell, let's say you're getting a brand new 
new refrigerator and you've got a perfectly usable refrigerator and you would like to uh, either give it away or at a very nominal fee, you want to, well, hey, make it available. Uh, let's say you've got a place to rent, all right? You're looking for uh, rent. We're not a property management service. We have people here who are, uh, but, but if you just got a place and you want to list it, yeah, hey, you can do that. Um, you have a need. You're looking for somebody to start mowing your lawn, okay? Um, not for free, but you're willing, you know, I mean, but you're, you're looking for a yard care person. Just, you know, pay. You know somebody, and then people could reach out to you. It's those kind of things, all right? You're an employer, and you're looking for an employee, okay? List, list it on there. So, uh, yes? S- Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. If you, if you own a business, you're part of our church family, you want to just say, hey, uh, let's say, for example, um, you're in the, you do a lot of landscape work around your house. It would be good to know that, that John Realhorn owns Belmont Nursery, okay? <laughs> Okay, uh, you, 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 you know, you need plumbing, uh, you know, there's a guy in our church who has Vern's Plumbing, and I know there's other people who probably have various things, and some of you would compete. Okay, let's go this one. You need a house painted. <laughs> we have 13 people in our church who paint houses, all right? <laughs> so the competition will get stiff and heavy right there, all right? Uh, but no, it's just, hey, you, you provide a service and folks might be interested. That's what this card is for, all right? And uh, so you fill it out. And to your group, by the way, John, we need to put these in the 8 o'clock service. I found out this morning they're not in the, okay, they're, they're not in the 8 o'clock service. Uh, things. So um, we need to do it. So that's what these in the, in the pew were for. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet. I think just one thing on here, and this is the men's overnight camping trip that's going to be in October, uh, October 21st through 23rd. It's a Friday and Saturday night going to uh, Shaver Lake at Camp Edison, and uh, you can bring a tailor or a trailer or a tent, or if you don't have either, you can stay in somebody's trailer or tent, all right? Let them know that on the paperwork, and uh, they'll follow up with you. 25 bucks, that includes your food. Uh, uh, and it should be a great time. And I only have one of these in here. Uh, so if I don't get another clipboard to go down this side here in a minute, there's not one up here somewhere, is there? All right. Um, then it'll make it all the way around. Okay. Um, starting September the 12th, uh, there is a room in our church that's being used by a, a, a lady uh, from our community. She does Singer's Company. And uh, you will find this brochure, I believe, over in the Jam Center as well. Uh, This is for young girls who would like to dance and sing. And uh, they have a program, and it's going to run, let's see here, I shouldn't have pulled this off, September 12th through December the 19th. From K through 2nd grade, they will meet from 340 to 440, from 3rd through 6th grade, 445 to 545. And the first class is free if you want to check it out. And then I have no idea what the cost is after that, but you can find that out from them when you show up for the freebie, okay? Um, Let me highlight a couple of other announcements and then a few prayer requests and we'll get engaged in our worship. Uh, College age, if we've got any of you who are in college, and I know uh, I just saw somebody 84 graduated last year. Uh, This college group is probably for those 18 to about 25, all right? Meeting at Bill and Lindsay Eccles' house on Thursday evening, so uh, tell your kids or your grandkids about it. Uh, The Urban Plunge has been canceled, all right, so that is not taking place for those of you who signed up, and I think you received a call as well. September the 10th is our men's quarterly breakfast. Bill Smithcamp from Wawona will be coming and sharing his testimony of faith. It ought to be a great, great breakfast. Guys, you can't beat the price. It's free. Coffee's ready by 7.30, and breakfast starts at 8 o'clock, and you're out of here before 9.30. Um, let's see here. This Wednesday night, our Jams Kids program starts now that summer is over, uh, over in the other building, and that goes from 7 to 8 o'clock. And uh, at that same time, there is a parenting class called Revolutionary Parenting, and Mark Addis will be teaching that class. We still have some students that need sponsors. Uh, It's $585 for the year. These are 32 students in the Ivory Coast of Africa in the village of Neonan. They are top students in the entire country, and we supported them last year for $585. $85, it closed them, it gets their books, it gets their vaccination, and it feeds them 
all right, for an entire year. You couldn't do that in Clovis for uh, probably 10 times that amount, all right? And so uh, your small group can do this. A couple of families can go in together and sponsor a child. There's uh, some blue paper up in the top corner. Uh, Put your name on it. Put it on the face of a child that's not already uh, got a sponsor, and then somebody will follow up with you this week and explain all about it, all right? So I think that covers the announcements today. Some prayer requests. As most of you know, uh, there was a tragedy that occurred at, uh, at the jail yesterday. We had two correctional officers who were shot. Uh, both of them had surgery. And do we have an update? I do not have an update this morning. Both of them were in critical condition. So please be praying for them and for their families at this time. Lawrence Ramirez, that is Milo's father-in-law, Lisa's dad. He went in on Friday to have an oblation done on his heart because it was going very slow and at times very fast. Um, Once they finished the oblation, it was still going very slow. (laughs) And so yesterday they put a pacemaker in. Uh, It went from 32 beats a minute to 69 beats a minute. So he's going home today, and we are very grateful for that. Marcy Power, sitting right here on the front row. She was in St. Agnes Hospital, and she had a pig valve put in her heart this week. And she is sitting on the front row, and she is 96 years old. Okay. She is no longer a kosher member of our church, but... uh, Uh, it was our pleasure, Marcy. I, didn't, I, I, I was not staying up with the technology. I did not realize that you could put a valve in the heart without open heart surgery anymore. They run that baby up that main artery, all right, from your groin right up to your heart, put it in place, and it works beautiful, all right? And uh, she had the nurses in stitches, all right, uh, two days after her surgery was over. And so we are grateful for that. When I saw her after surgery, she did oink at me the first time I walked in, but... <laughs> Uh, we're, we're getting past that, so it's great to see you out today. This, um, this past week, we shared in, uh, in two memorial services. I want you to be remembering to pray for uh, Tom Gillespie's family, all right? I know they would appreciate that very, very much. They're, uh, Tom's daughter and son-in-law and grandkids attend church here, and uh, so please just be remembering that family. Uh, Rick Lewis's mom's service is going to be this coming Saturday in Bakersfield, And then uh, Eric Jackson. Uh, Eric Jackson's the gentleman I talked about last week. Um, Actually, his mom was in service at 8 o'clock this morning. Uh, She's the one that Ryan, all right, our IT guy back there running the video equipment, uh, he took time on his first honeymoon night to show care and compassion to somebody at the hotel uh, who needed it. So he wasn't so focused on himself that he didn't have time to notice. And... uh, Told, told Linda Jackson about New Hope, and she attended the following Sunday and the following week. She called me. I know a Linda Jackson I grew up going to church with, and so I think I scared her when I got on the phone because I was so excited to talk to Linda Jackson, um, an old friend that I ended up making a new friend named Linda Jackson. And uh, they, they are from upstate New York, and um, they were here helping their son with... Uh, um, with his spouse, all right, and uh, she passed away uh, two weeks later, and her service was this past week, and we do have folks in our church, I didn't realize, who were related to her as well until the memorial service, so do be remembering that family. I know they would appreciate that so very much. Those are the updates I needed to share with you. I'm going to invite uh, our Ushers to come forward as we have our morning tithes and offering. Uh, Charlene Dooms uh, finished another round of chemo. She's been recuperating some this week. Starts again this coming week, Bernice. She will start again on the 12th. uh, Still waiting for a match for a bone marrow transplant. So come on, come, come on up. You didn't have to come up, did you? You have to step back. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we love you so much. We are grateful for your availability to our lives. We are grateful that you are are the source of strength, particularly when we are weak. You are the one who extends hope to us, even in the most despairing of moments. You are the one who says that you can be our peace that's beyond any kind of comprehension. Even when the world does its best to knock the snot out of us, you tell us that we can abide in your peace in life's worst moments. 
There have been some who've gone through some of those worst moments in recent days, and we are grateful for your availability and your presence and your sufficiency in their lives. Father, there are those who are going through some situations they've not shared with anybody. And I pray that though they think nobody else knows about it, I trust they rest in the promise that you know about it. And you are willing and ready and available to be at work in their lives and in their circumstances. But you're a gentleman. You never barge into our world. Revelation describes it this way. You stand at the door and knock. You wait to be an invited member of our life and our experiences and our circumstances. And you tell us that once invited in, we will have great fellowship with you. And out of that fellowship comes confidence. And out of that fellowship comes excitement. And out of that fellowship comes joy. And out of that fellowship, we experience your peace. And so, Father, we trust you for that today. Lord, I trust that the message you have prepared in my heart is what you have in store for all of us and that uh, it'll be by your spirit, by your activity in our midst that we will, we will hear what it is that you have to say to us. This is not about what Tim has to say to anybody, but this is about what truth from your word has to say to each of us. May we have, as the scripture says, ears to hear. And then, Father, I pray may we also have wills to obey. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing. You are so gracious to meet the needs not only of New Hope Church, but the way in which you want to use the resources through New Hope for kingdom work to advance your name, your purpose, your cause, your plan literally around the world. Thank you. We trust you for all this. Lord, I, I, I pause to pray just before I close for, um, for law enforcement personnel who are in the hospital right now. For that man, for that woman. Uh, Lord, we pray for their families. We pray for the ongoing skill of the doctors and the, the staff providing care. Father, we pray for, um, we simply pray for law enforcement nationwide. Uh, Lord, we pray for um, their best. Uh, we are so grateful for the duties that they perform. Lord, we pray that you'll give them wisdom how to perform those duties. And uh, we simply trust you for their needs today. I pray for our state. Lord, we are, as a state, we have moved far, far from you. And so there are needs that are going on. Father, we look at it and we say, we don't even know how to begin to be engaged in making a difference. And so, Father, we just pray for your wisdom. We pray that somehow, some way, um, the longing of our hearts, revival, would break out in California. I would love for it to happen in Sacramento and that revival would take place so that the culture of this state would be one which honors you rather than destroys your word. Give us wisdom as citizens here, Lord, to be, to be not only citizens of heaven but citizens on earth in the way that you would have us to be. We trust you for all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, I invite you to find uh, Psalm 119, if you would please, the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest song in the hymnal, Psalm 119. I'm going to let Lynn know. Um, I'm going to be all over the chapter today, so you, don't, don't, you just don't even worry about it, all right? All right, don't, don't even worry about trying to do it. It's, today is not a specific section like we have the last few weeks. We are going to look at the general theme of the entire chapter from verse 1 to verse 176, and uh, that's going to be our direction today. Most of you will probably know the name Ernest Hemingway. You two probably have no idea, do you? Okay, oh, go, oh good, you've, you've read him in school. Oh, good, good, all right. Um, Ernest Hemingway was uh, a Nobel laureate. He's a literary genius. And here's what he said about his life in the last few years. He said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug it in. Sounds rather miserable, doesn't it? It sounds like a guy who might ask a question similar to this, what works when life doesn't? You ever ask that question? 
probably in one form, fashion, or another you have. There's a startling statement that Hemingway made given the fact of the quality of life that he lived. You see, Hemingway's life would have been the envy of most people in his day who had bought into the values of modern society. Hemingway was known for his tough guy image, his globe-trotting pilgrimages to exotic places. He was a big game hunter, a bullfighter, a man who could drink the best of them under the table. He lived in Cuba and on a sailboat. He had a place in Idaho as well as California. He was married four times. He lived his life seemingly without any kind of moral restraint or conscience. But one sunny Sunday morning in Idaho, he ended his life with a shotgun blast. A lot of folks don't realize there was another side to Hemingway's life, one that few people know about. Hemingway grew up in a Christian home. His grandparents were missionaries. His father was involved in the church, and his father's good friend was Dwight L. Moody, the founder of Moody Bible College. As a boy, Hemingway himself was very active in the church that his parents attended. Then World War I came, and as a war correspondent, Hemingway saw death and despair firsthand. His youthful enthusiasm for Christianity soured, and Hemingway eventually rejected the faith that he thought he once had claimed. You see, genuine faith means more than living in a Christian environment. It's more than memorizing the catechisms or conforming to the codes and even affirming that you believe in the truths of Scripture. True believers are non-negotiated followers of Jesus Christ. And there is a desire in each of our hearts to progressively move toward Him in understanding all of life in the context of God's teachings. The point is not Hemingway's life today. The point of today's message is my life and your life. If we aren't cultivating a vital relationship with Jesus Christ through His Word, then we too might respond as Hemingway did when life's questions are agonizingly unanswerable or when our inner impulses are too seductive for us to resist. An allegiance based on systems and rituals and rules is never enough to keep us loyal. One wonders how a person loses their enthusiasm for life and God to end it with a shotgun blast. Most of us will not go to that extreme, but every one of us at one time or another will ask ourselves the question, what is going to work because life isn't? Psalm 119 is a passage that I think introduces us to the idea of God-given enthusiasm. That word enthusiasm is a very interesting word. It's derived from two Greek words. Greek is what the New Testament was written in, and our modern-day English word enthusiasm comes from joining these two Greek words together. The first Greek word is the word, it's spelled E-N, and it's pronounced in. And let me tell you what it means. It means in. (laughs) I-N. Okay, very profound, all right? Um, They just didn't know how to spell in Greek, E-N-I-N, okay? The second part of the word is where it gets fascinating. The second part of our word enthusiasm comes from a Greek word, theos. How many of you know what the word theos means? Perfect. Good job. Theos means God. So this word enthusiasm comes from joining these two words together, in God, God in. It carries the idea that we are inspired by God in us. In the original sense of the word, a person was so overtaken with the presence of God that he or she could barely contain their excitement. That makes sense. The truth of God applied to our circumstances brings a burst of enthusiasm like no one else can provide. Think about a new home, a new boat, a new car, new clothes. They give us this temporary high until the bill shows up and then the grind is on. 
A new job's exciting, but it dries up after a few months. A new marriage partner makes us feel perky until the daily grind begins to erode the fun memories of a fantasy honeymoon. All those things may eventually leave us feeling responsible or disappointed or disillusioned. Sometimes we might even grow bored. We need something more than these things these things that the world can provide, we need something substantial. What we need is the Greek version of enthusiasm, God in. And I believe that's what Psalm 119 really is all about. A little bit of this will be reviewed, but I want to share with you a grand theme of this entire incredible song. It is the longest song in the ancient hymnal. It is a song that is full of God in kind of statements. Over and over again, this long song affirms the value of having God's Word in our lives. It keeps pounding away on the theme with a heavy, powerful, musical beat. There is one statement after another announcing the joys, the fresh motivation, the unique benefits of having God's book inside our lives. Let's see if this morning we can get a grasp of this whole song. This is the longest song. Not only that, it's the longest chapter, as you know, of the whole Bible, comprised of how many verses? 176, yes. No other chapter comes close in its length. It is longer. This one song is longer than 30 other books of the Bible. The song has an unusual feature that we've talked about in the past that can only be appreciated in the Hebrew. It really doesn't have an impact on us. It's got 22 sections. It begins with every successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. In other words, the first eight verses is the word A, if we were to do this in English. And the second eight verses is B, and the second eight verses is C. And every word of the first of each verse in each of those sections begins with that letter. And that was for the purpose of helping memory. They could memorize this chapter by remembering their Hebrew alphabet. Since you and I don't know the Hebrew alphabet, you just have to get excited about what I told you and forget the fact that it doesn't make any sense, all right? But it did to them. It did to them. The poetical structure is called acrostic, and it made it easy for them to memorize. What I'm going to take the next few minutes to do is I want to challenge you with the sufficiency of the Scripture as a very unique feature of this one song, the sufficiency of the Scripture, the fact that David is telling us in this song, God's Word is enough. It is enough. You see, first of all, in this chapter, we discover that, that this chapter is a tribute to God's Word. It reveals what the Scripture does for us and what you and I must do with the Scripture. God's Word is mentioned in every single one of these 176 verses. I'm just going to pick some at random to prove my point, okay? Verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your law. I did not pre-pick these. I'm just, I'm just, just jumping in. All right, verse 65, I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. Verse 86, all your commands are trustworthy. Verse 114, you are my refuge and shield. I have put my hope in your word. Every single verse, 176 of them, include the Word of God except three. Three out of 176. Verse 84, verse 90, verse 132, do not mention word, commands, precepts. All right? So just three out of one. Would you say that's kind of the key theme of this book, this chapter? I think so. Psalm 119, interesting little thing, Psalm 119 is similar in content to Psalm 1 and to Psalm 19. And if you put those two together, what number do you have? 119. If you want to read Psalm 119 but you don't have an hour, read Psalm 1. Okay, if you want to read Psalm 119 but you don't have, you know, an hour, read Psalm 19. They're much shorter, but they are basically summaries of this much larger song. David also illustrates in Psalm 119 how much God's Word should dominate his life. He tells us in various verses, and we'll look at them in just a moment, but he tells us that he spent time in the Word before dawn. He spends time in the Word daily. He spends time in the Word seven times a day. He spends time in the Word nightly. He spends time in the Word at midnight. 
Let me just highlight those verses. Look at verse 147. 147. I rise before dawn and I cry for help. I've put my hope in your word. David is saying, hey God, I start my day looking to your word. I'll make this strong suggestion. If you start your day looking into God's word, it will be much easier to go to God's word throughout the day. If you don't start your day in God's word, who knows how many hours may go by before you even begin to think about God's word I'm convinced one of the best places to keep a Bible or a devotional book is right by your bedside. So it's the first thing you see when you wake up in the morning as a reminder of how I need to start my day. Then he talks about being in the Word daily. Go to verse 97. Verse 97. And it reads, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. He says, I do it seven times a day. Flip over to verse 164, all right, 164. He said, seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. God, hey, seven times during the day, all right, so if you're awake 14 hours, that's every two hours, David is saying, God, I'm going to pause to praise you for your word, which makes a difference in my life. Then he says, I even do this at night. Notice, uh, let's go to the 148. We're closer to that one right now. One for, my eyes stay open through the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. I am pretty convinced that David didn't stay awake every night. What I am convinced is that David is telling us during those moments when life doesn't work and my body won't let me sleep, I spend my time, God, in your word. During the watches of the night, during the troubled moments of my evenings, God, I put my attention on you and not my problems. There's another verse, verse 55. David says, in the night I remember your name, O Lord, and I will keep your law. And then verse 62, he says, I even remember you at midnight. At midnight I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. You see, God's word dominated this writer's life. The sufficiency of scripture is illustrated here because it refers to God in every verse. God and his word are not identical, but they are inseparable. And there's not a verse that God has left out. He's either mentioned to as God, Lord, he, or his. In every single verse of 176 verses, it permeates the whole thing. This is also a personal psalm. David refers to himself 325 times in this psalm. The psalm describes an intimate relationship between the believer and his Bible. Here's a question. Let me make this a family feud question. 100 people were asked in church on Sunday morning. If you, had to, if you had to evaluate your love for God's word on a scale of 1 to 10, what would it be? Don't, you don't have to say it out loud. Okay. Here's what I can promise you. You will win more than $20,000 by letting this word be a part of your life every moment of every day. How much do you love spending time in his book. Next, it says this, this passage is a collection of prayers and meditations. After the first three verses, everything else is a personal prayer or a meditation for us to contemplate. The writer makes about 70 requests in this psalm. This psalm also reveals that the writer is going through a tough time in his life. He's suffering some kind of affliction. This is mentioned in 65 of the 176 verses, that this is a tough time in David's life. David comes to grip with the question, what works when life doesn't? And he says, it is God's word that keeps me on track. This psalm carries the word of God as the theme from the first verse to the last verse. The composer employs several synonyms for scripture throughout the song. Let me highlight, there's 10 different words that David uses to describe and define the Word of God. 
All right? So the first word that's used is uh, what we translate in English, law. All right? It comes from the Hebrew word Torah. You've heard the word Torah before. How do you know the word Torah? Yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's called the Torah. All right? Um, that word is used 25 times. It denotes direction and instruction. This word usually refers to a body of teaching like the books of Genesis to Deuteronomy. Mentioned 25 times, that very Hebrew word. The next word translated for God's word is the word word. In the Hebrew, it's dabar. And some of you, I don't expect you to remember any of these Hebrew words, okay? I just want to prove to you I studied this week, okay? So dabar. Is the, the word tra- It's used 20 times, and it's the general term for God's revelation. The Ten Commandments are known from the Hebrew as the Ten Words, okay, as illustrated in Deuteronomy 4.13. The third word translated is the word sayings. It's imrath. It's used 19 times, and it's translated as sayings, words, and promises. The fourth word used in this song is commandments. It's mitzvah. It's used 21 times in the plural and once in the singular. It has the idea of a clear, definite, authoritative word. Then the fifth word is statutes, hukum, used 21 times, and it means things inscribed or engraved. It denotes that these are permanent and fixed and the unchangeable nature of God's word. Boy, Does our country need to understand something about God's Word, that it is unchangeable? We're creating laws because of how people feel rather than because of what is true. And God says, here are my laws. They change not. The sixth word is the word judgment, mishpat, used 19 times plural, four times singular, stands for the legal decision or a ruling from the bench, and it establishes a precedent. If there needs to be a precedent set in your life, who ought to call that shot? God's Word. God's Word. Not our feelings. The seventh word is precepts. This is the one I have a tough time saying. Pecutum. It's used 21 times, and it's the idea of taking charge. It refers to God's Word as mandates and requirements. God's Word should shake charge of my life. Number eight, testimonies. Edoth is the word. It's used 22 times, and it refers to the solemn declaration of God's standard for human behavior. Testimonies. Uh, Excuse me, number nine, ways. Derek, it's used five times, uh, plurally six times singular. It refers to the pattern of life marked out by God's word. As you plan your life, do you go here to lay out the course for the way in which you're going to live? Does it govern your ethics? Does it govern your moral behavior? Does it govern the decisions that you make? Does it govern the treatment of people? God says, and David says, God's word ought to be that which directs all of that. And then the tenth word is the word paths, aura. It's used five times, and it's similar to the word ways. Walk in his ways. Walk in his paths. The purpose of the psalm is to give praise to God for his word. David wants folks to understand it is God's word that enabled me to slay a giant in a valley. It is God's word who enabled me to survive when I was hiding in a cave, uh, terrified from my life. It is God's word who rescued me from my own foolishness by committing the sin of adultery with Bathsheba. It is God's word who makes a difference in my life when life seems to be destroying me. The purpose of this psalm is to give praise to God for his word and then not only praise him for his word, and here's the next part, we're good on Sunday mornings probably at coming to give praise to God for who he is and what his word says, but the the other part of this psalm is that we are to demonstrate how we are to behave in relationship to the scripture. Does what we hear on Sunday morning, does what you read Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, does it find expression in the way in which you live? Mom and dad, does it impact the way you parent your kids? Kids, does it impact the way in which you honor your mom and dad? Does it change the way in which you deal with a neighbor who doesn't live the way you like them to, annoys you? Does it make a difference on your job situation? 
Does the Word of God have power and influence in your life? There's an old German version of the Bible that places this following description at the very beginning of Psalm 119, and it says this, This is the Christian's golden ABCs of praise, love, power, and the use of God's Word. Here's the deal. If you're not going to obey it, why read it? And maybe there's a possibility that's why you don't read it. It's because you don't want to have to obey it. Notice with me next, the value of God's Word. The value of God's words when circumstances try to knock the stuffing out of us in life. Go to verse 28. And you are going to discover that God's Word is good in times of sorrow. God's Word is good for us in times of sorrow. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. When you are grieving over something, the death of a loved one, a friend, the loss of a job, the end of a marriage, a fractured relationship with your kids, when your soul is weary, where's the first place you turn? Booze? Some new excitement? Some new relationship? Food? I kind of like that one. What do we turn to? David says, when my soul is weary, it is the word of God that strengthens me. It strengthens us when, we, when sorrow tries to weaken us. Look at verse 50. It deals with the same subject. My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise renews my life. The word comforts me and renews me when suffering stresses me. The value of God's word is not only that it's good when we sorrow, but the promises of God are sweet when life is not. Look at verse 103. Songs have been, been written about this passage. I remember, um, I remember Andre Crouch sitting on a piano bench in Fresno and playing a song that he had just written. And oh, could he, and it was all from this one verse. I wish I could sing it for you right now. Notice what 103 says. How sweet are your promises to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Honey. I don't know about you, but when you take, if, if you like honey, when you take a taste of it, you want more. Um, I remember as a kid, my mom would have fresh honey. Uncle Connell had honey bees and sometimes would bring us in a foil, uh, a foil pan on a Sunday morning. He'd bring us a chunk of honeycomb smothered with honey on it, and, and he'd have it wrapped in foil, and it would be on the counter, man, Monday morning. What, what, you, what did I want for breakfast Monday morning? I want a toast. And normally I would eat two pieces of toast. That would be, you know, if, if dad wasn't fixing biscuits and gravy, I had two pieces of toast. And that, man, when we had fresh honey, I could go from two pieces to four pieces of toast, all right, before I went to school. And it wasn't because I liked the bread. It's because I loved the honey. It makes me want more. It's pure sweetness. It's a spiritual delicacy. It infuses our life with energy. But catch this, guys. To enjoy the taste of God's honey, we must have a palate of faith. Without faith, the word is not sweet to us. You see, without faith, the word brings conviction to us. Once conviction has done its work, then it begins to taste good. Before power drinks and powders that you could put in your beverages or on your food, when I used to run track, the coach told us all on track meet day, get your mom to get you a bottle of Sue B. Honey, the bear. Put that in your bag in 15 minutes before you run. Okay. Why? Because it gave you energy. It, 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 it got your body enthused for what it was about ready to do. The scripture says, take God's honey. Get it in you 
and it will give you what you need for the day. The third value of God's word, as described by David in this psalm, is found in 127 and 128. The value of God's word is better than pure gold. Notice what it said. This is not 14 karat gold. This is pure gold. Because I love your commands more than gold. Because I love your commands more than pure gold. And because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. The psalmist tells us it's more valuable to me than gold because it prompts me to not want to participate in evil, but to pursue righteousness. And the fourth value that God's word adds for us is the commands of God are delightful when our times are troubled. Notice verse 143. Trouble and distress have come upon me, but your commands are my delight. When mingled emotions of trouble and distress bring dark clouds into our lives, the commands of God reveals there's a silver lining. When we resort to the word of God during terrible circumstances, instead of being directed and driven by our emotion, God brings delight to us. Remember this truth. Remember this. Before resurrection, there is crucifixion. On crucifixion day, Everybody thought the end of the world had come. But resurrection could not happen till crucifixion occurred. God can take the junk in life and bring about something incredible. Sometimes low enthusiasm results from not having sufficient knowledge to address life's difficulties. When you don't know how to respond to a situation, when you don't know how to think about a situation, what is your first inclination? Do you go ask somebody else? Do you look at your relationships around you and say, well, this is what they obviously think because this is how they respond? Or do you go to God's truth? God, what should I believe? What should I believe about sex outside of marriage? God, what should I believe about how to treat um, an employer who hates me? God, how should I respond to how I use my finances? Do, do, do you go here or do you look at your circumstances and talk to your friends? David said, I go to the Word of God. While additional training and management or finances or parenting can certainly help. All of our knowledge must be built upon a foundation of spiritual wisdom. In verses 98 to 100, if I had a, a, a thrust today, here it is. In verses 98 to 100, David speaks of the superiority of the word over three sources of truth held in high esteem by the world. He said, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. The word of God makes us wiser than our enemies. The world puts great importance on knowledge that is gained from experience in life. In this case, the songwriter mentions experience in dealing with enemies, but he says the one who has a grasp of the word of God is wiser than those enemies. Sometimes difficult people can drag down our enthusiasm, and divine wisdom helps us rise above the negative effects of people who drag us down. The word also gives us more insight than all of our teachers. Our world puts great confidence in education, while additional knowledge in a field of study or training a particular skill never hurts, the Lord says that the one who knows the Word of God possesses more insight than even his educators or teachers. For what good is a degree if you don't know how to live wisely? What help is vocational training if foolishness leads us astray? The third thing the Word causes us to have is more understanding than the aged. I wholeheartedly encourage respect for older people. I'm becoming one of them. Some would say, too late, you're already there. Yet age doesn't necessarily lead to good understanding. What is the old saying? There's no, there's no fool like an old fool. A knowledge and an application of the written truths of God's word will better equip us 
for life than the combined advantages of hard knock experiences, dedicated teachers, and even decades of living. The scripture provides more than mere knowledge. From the Bible, you and I are given insight. It's probably why Chuck Swindoll named his radio program Insights for Living. That is what this book gives to us. Insight translates into effectiveness. Effectiveness leads to success. Success builds confidence, and confidence inspires enthusiasm. As you glance over these same three verses, we discover three benefits by those who absorb the word. There is wisdom defined, there is insight, and there is understanding. Wisdom is looking at life with its difficulties from God's point of view. It's second story living. The ability to see circumstances as opportunities that God has designed to develop us as his child. This opportunity to teach us how not to let bitterness control our life or irritation be the theme of our story. And he replaces those things with gratitude and enthusiasm. Insight. Insight is seeing through life and its difficulties from God's viewpoint. As we grow in the Word, we gain ability to penetrate the surface level of those irritations and frustrations. We see beneath the outer mask. Teachers can communicate knowledge, but the Word alone can give us insight. And understanding is the ability to respond to life situations and difficulties from the panoramic, comprehensive perspective of God. As we get a hold of the Word and as the Word gets a hold of us, we not only gain insight to see the inner workings of a matter, but we discover how to respond with the right effort for the best outcomes. We are able to learn from our decisions even when things don't turn out our way. We find that our attitude is important to God as our activity and sometimes even more so. Let me wrap this up a bit with a case study real quick. Let's imagine that you recently got a job that's proven to be less than you expected. You prayed for employment. You had others pray that you would get this job, and lo and behold, you got the job. You were very grateful. But after a few weeks, you were found that the working conditions leave much to be desired. Furthermore, the fellow employees are pretty much non-Christian and they're rather petty. Your first natural response would be disappointment, maybe even disillusionment. This would lead to some daily irritations and possible arguments with others that you work with. Your life could, could quickly become consumed by negative, pessimistic assaults on others. You might even get mad at God for getting you this job you ask Him for. Exit motivation, enter low enthusiasm. How much better would it be to go to the Word, like Psalm 119, and to begin to apply some basic biblical principles to the situation? This is where wisdom, insight, and understanding come in. Let's say you're deeply involved in God's Word, absorbing wisdom, cultivating this insight. You discover from Romans 8.28 that God uses all things to work together for good. You even discover Romans 5, 3 through 5, that God uses difficult times to mature our faith. This truth gives you a different perspective. You realize, I am God's personal project. His plan is to develop me into a mature, stable person. He has all of our good at heart. Nothing is coincidental in the Christian life. All things, even this miserable job of yours, are tools in God's hand, and He is lovingly shaping your character. You learn to accept that your job, with all of its limitations and irritations, is a perfect place for God to mature you and to make you more like His Son. Rather than resist or look for the first escape, your resolve to greet each day with another opportunity to grow in grace towards others and submission to Him, wisdom helps you look at the situation from His viewpoint. But by the way, this might apply not only to work, it could apply to your marriage. It could apply to your relationship with other people. Then those who work around you, all of a sudden they're not bothering you as much because God's Word has taught you how to see through the surface problems. You now see that their verbal assaults are indicative of a deeper inner turmoil and problem. You also learn that you need not take their abuse personally because it's really not directed at you personally. Soon your insight has saved you from ugly, irritating, retaliatory spirit. Instead of arguing with them, you are now finding ways to help your coworkers. You've now begun to respond to your once irritating occupation with a very positive, healthy attitude. 
Time that you've recently spent in the book of James and the New Testament, for example, has taught you to be very careful about what you say and how you behave to those who don't know Christ. Furthermore, in doing a diligent job, regardless of the circumstances, you have gleaned understanding. And to your own great surprise, you've actually begun to enjoy and accept the challenge of your situation because you know that it's exactly where the Lord wants you. It's an ideal place for you to make Christ known. Now, don't misunderstand. I can't guarantee that the regular interaction with Scripture, that you will transform your environment. Some circumstances are beyond help. Believe me, as a pastor, I never rule out the possibility of miraculous divine intervention. But I've become wise enough in life to recognize my own limitations. So I don't want to create the impression that you will change your world by gaining spiritual understanding. But here's what I can guarantee you. You will be transformed. You and I will be changed. And through our spiritual growth, the Lord may improve our environment a great deal. Regardless of whether he does or not, we will be transformed. Our attitude will change. Enthusiasm will fill the void that was created by helplessness and hopelessness. God's word is for each of you. It's not just for the pastor or the theologian. It's for you. There is no situation that you cannot face if you are really serious about spending time on a regular basis in the book of books. And a great place to start is the Song of Songs, Psalm 119, especially if the grind of low enthusiasm has begun to take its toll. Let me close. People on a plane and people on a pew have a lot in common. All of us are on a journey. We're going somewhere. Most are satisfied with a predictable experience. We like to say, it was a nice flight. Eh, it was a nice worship service today. We exit the same way we entered. And we're happy to return the next time. But I'm pretty confident there are a few of you who are not content with nice. You long for more. The boy who passed Max Lucado one day on a plane asked as soon as he entered the plane, will they let me see the pilot? The pilot heard and he invited the boy into the cockpit world of controls and gauges. Minutes later, this boy popped out with wide eyes and he yelled for everybody on the plane to hear, wow, I'm glad to be on this plane. Nobody else's face showed such wonder. The middle-aged woman carrying beach bags was giggling down the aisle. The fellow in the blue suit was cranky. Most were content to be on the plane to sit and stare and say little. But the boy, he wanted to see the pilot. He probably wouldn't say the flight was nice, but he would show those plastic wings and, and the tell about how the pilot gave to him, and he would say, I saw the man up front. Enter a church sanctuary and look at the faces. A few are giggling. Some are answering their phone. <laughs> um, Bob Berthold, one of the owners of uh, Farewell Funeral Home, I heard him say yesterday, it was very interesting, I hadn't heard him say that before, um, he was politely telling folks to turn their phones off before we started the, the, the service. And he said, uh, because if your phone rings during a service, that is God calling you, wanting you to quote scripture right now. <laughs> Back to the boy. Enter a church sanctuary and look at the faces. A few are giggling. There's probably more than a couple who are cranky. But by and large, we are content just to be here, to sit, to look straight ahead, and to leave when the service isn't over and say, that was a nice service. A few, however, and I trust it will be more than just a few who seek something more, have a heart that is hungry for the Word of God, come with childlike enthusiasm and see the one up front.
His name is God. He loves you more than you know. And if you want to know, read what he wrote. Let's pray. Our Father, Psalm 119 tells us that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Too many of us simply settle for you being a nightlight somewhere in our world that keeps us from being afraid. But Father, you have so much more. You've got bright lights and strong lamps that want to make a difference in the way we live. If our enthusiasm gauge is low, then it's because your word in us is diminished. So God, I pray that whether we feel like it or not, we will choose to be engaged in your word in the morning, throughout the day, in the dark, dark moments of a night, the watches of the night. May we trust, investigate, seek, live, depend, trust, follow, obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, have a great day. Wasn't that nice?